Hello everyone. Welcome to our virtual highlights tour of the Hugh Lane Gallery. Uh, due to the ongoing pandemic, I sadly cannot be there to show you the works in person, but I do highly recommend that if you ever get a chance, go into the gallery, see the works in person, as the images and illustrations do not do justice to the real wonder of the works on display. The Hugh Lane Gallery, located here in Dublin, uh, is believed to be the oldest museum of modern art in the entire world. And it was founded in 1908 by a man called Hugh Lane. And part of Hugh Lane's vision for the gallery was that it would be available to everyone. So it was from the very beginning, open late in the evenings and free to be visited, to be visited by every person, regardless of social standing or uh, economic situation. And we try to keep that alive to this day. We encourage anyone to get a chance to come in, appreciate the work. This is Dublin's, this is Dublin City's gallery, and we hope to see you in there. As you can see from the first image, we have the beautiful facade to the gallery. Uh, the gallery is located inside Charlemont House, built in 1763, with several more modern uh, extensions being added to it in order to ensure that the gallery can properly care for the works in the collection. I'm go we're going to start with one of my personal favourites, arguably my favourite piece of Irish art ever produced, and that is this very beautiful stained glass window by Harry Clark. This is the Eve of St Agnes and it's I think very, very fortuitous that we have it here in the collection as it was actually made just down the road from where the gallery is located on North Frederick Street in Harry Clark's studio. Harry Clark was a master of stained glass art as well as being an illustrator and he was able to combine these two very, uh, these two different skill sets to create a astonishingly beautiful and detailed work like the Eve of St. Agnes. This is arguably his masterpiece. Uh, produced in 1924, it was commissioned by Harold Jacobs of Jacobs Biscuit Factory, who was the grandson of one of the original founders. And Jacobs wanted Clara to create a window for the staircase hall of his father's home in Aylesbury Road. Initially, Jacobs had had quite a simple idea for the windows, maybe using themes like uh, uh, night and morning, summer and winter. But Harry Clark was a lover of stories. And he saw this as an opportunity to really get his teeth into a good narrative story. He gave Jacobs a selection of tales to choose from such as Sleeping Beauty, Bluebeard, uh, the Playboy of the Western World, but ultimately Jacobs chose The Eve of St. Agnes, that famous Victorian poem that Clark himself was a massive fan of. And Clark has interpreted the quite long poem into these 14 different panels, going left to right and down across each of the two windows we can see that he has actually taken segments from the story and illustrated them in these panels, taking a lot of inspiration from the poem, from its use of color, its imagery, to really create these very beautiful, magical scenes. Uh, when we look at the piece, it can be quite I suppose misleading to an extent at first as to exactly how he creates such stained glass work. Each of the major panels we're seeing is not composed of hundreds of tiny little pieces of glass. Instead, there are only 14 main panels that Clark uh, placed into the window with this black leading. He then proceeds to disguise the leading as pillars or uh, ceilings. You can see this very beautiful kind of elephant pillar right in the center that connects and joins the two pieces of glass. He will then actually draw onto the glass using his skill as an illustrator 
and then scratch into what he's drawn to create this really detailed kind of cross hatching texture to his work. He gets this beautiful range of colors by using something called acid etching glass, where he takes flash glass and he uses acids to remove parts of the color from uh, the colored glass, enabling him to get numerous different tones of blues, of purples, and when of course he lays, you know, say, red flash glass, blue flash glass, he can name, he can create purple glass, he can create orange, green, whatever color he needs, just by combining these different layers of glass, one on top of the other. Clark has even gone and included seg little segments from the poem written in tiny, tiny lettering right underneath the bottom of each panel. Uh, as I say, folks, this is just a piece that's brimming with detail. And if you get a chance to see it, I would highly, highly recommend it. Uh, it's been in the gallery since 1978 and it's part of our stained glass room. In fact, it's one of the first works you will see when you enter the gallery. But as I mentioned a few minutes ago, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the collection was founded by Hugh Lane back in 1908. And Hugh Lane was himself an art dealer and collector known for his kind of, his almost unique ability to recognize great art even before it was recognized by and large. And it's because of that, that he was able to purchase and uh, collect a large number of what were in his time, the most cutting edge and groundbreaking paintings by artists like Edward Manet, Claude Monet, Renoir, all these famous French impressionists, um, and modernists who were working in the end of the 19th century. One of the most important pieces he managed to get for his collection was this piece by Edouard Manet, La Musique aux Tuileries, or Music in the Tuileries Gardens. And this was a common day-to-day uh, -day occurrence where Parisians would go to a free concert in the Tuileries Gardens and listen to the music performed. You can see a large number of people gathered around waiting for the music to begin. However, this piece, when it was first uh, displayed in Manet's one-man show in 1862, it was groundbreaking in almost every aspect of its creation from the unique compositional choices. For example, there is only a small patch of blue sky, kind of a triangle right in the center at the very top, to the choice to have uh, the men in their long black coats kind of mirroring the long dark tree trunks of the park. There's the actual style, the texture of the painting, done in a very quick painterly style with not a lot of polish or refinement. This would have all been extremely controversial and again absolutely groundbreaking for this time period. What was perhaps so the, the most uh, I suppose new element to the work was the subject matter. This painting, The Music in the Tulia Gardens, is considered to be the first great piece of modern urban painting, the first great painting of a modern urban city setting. Uh, up until this point, while you could have contemporary uh, scenes in prints or illustrations, it was not viewed as a suitable subject for fine art. So by Manet painting these these people in this park, again, living a very contemporary, uh, almost normal life and enjoying the day-to-day -day activities of the Parisian people. He is breaking away from established traditions in, in French art. And this was very much part of the idea of 
Manet and his friend Baudelaire, who had this idea that it was fine art that was the best medium to convey modernity, uh, as, we, as fine art and painting could capture emotions, movement, fashions, uh, visually arrest people far more than even modern literature could do. And this was elaborated in Baudelaire's essay in 1863, where he said that it was not only right, but heroic for a modern day painter to paint contemporaneous life, as opposed to the more traditional historical or religious painting. Manet has filled the painting with his circle of friends, artists, poets, composers, uh, even his own family, just off to the center right there, you can see his brother, Eugene, while the man sitting down beside him is the composer Offenbach. You have Baudelaire kind of in the middle left against a tree trunk. Beside him is the artist Henry Fanton Latour looking directly at the audience. And at the very, very left edge of the painting, just looking at us, is Manet himself. Uh, one of Baudelaire's ideas in this kind of philosophy of modernity was that the artist, in order to really capture the modern life of the city, should be simultaneously part of the crowd, but also separated from it. Uh, a term he dubbed the flaneur, the stroller or the loafer. And it's taught by some critics that Manet's inclusion to put himself in the painting but right at the extreme edge was his way of conveying this philosophy. Uh, while Edward Manet is one of the most important, actually one of the first of the modernist painters, he is perhaps not the most famous. You could argue the most famous of them would go to the man who created the next painting, Claude Monet. And here we see another painting that Hugh Lane purchased for the collection, Lavacourt Under Snow. Monet painted this uh, during his time living in Vétoul in France from, seven, from 1878 to 1881. And this was a very difficult time of Monet's life. His wife had, had passed away. He was raising his two children, he was suffering uh, financially, and he was even forced to live with a bankrupt former patron of his, Ernst Touchet. Also, during that time, the weather wasn't great. Monet, as we know him now, is famous for his en plein air paintings, his painting outdoors. And in the winter of 1878, France was struck with one of the worst winters of the entire 19th century. Uh, the weather was so bad that it actually reached temperatures of minus 25 Celsius by mid-December. So Monet, who had so loved painting outdoors, was forced inside to paint, something which seemed to cause him no, no small amount of frustration, to the point that by mid-December, he had decided to essentially brave the cold and paint these outdoor snow scenes, which as I'm sure you can imagine was at the, ve was at the very least a massive test of endurance. But it is during this time in Vettel that Monet begins to transform into the artist we know today. It was during this time that he came across the almost singular idea that would define his career going forward. The idea that things do not stay the same from one hour to the next. Everything is influenced by atmosphere and light. And, what, and while you may paint one scene at a certain time of day, in perhaps spring, it will not be the same by any regards uh, sunset at the end of summer it will look completely different. Similarly, in cloud, in sun, in rain, in snow, landscapes are transformed by these transient weather conditions. 
and Monet dedicated his life then to create, to trying to capture this, these singular moments in time, these kind of very quick, oh, ephemeral scenes that would never happen again. And we really can see that in Lava Court Under Snow. The painting is, as, is a snow scene of Lava Court, but for a scene that's almost entirely covered in snow, Monet has used a very small amount of white. The foreground, which is this lovely snowbank covered in, sh in shadow, is painted with these deep blues and greys, where only the tiniest patches of white actually coming true. While in the background you have this big hill covered in snow, because of the light of the sun shining on it, it instead glows these creams and pinks and reds and purples, just a whole kaleidoscope of color. Similarly, the River Seine that divides the two sides of the bank is this quite uh, almost very a meditative greenish gray that even though it's covered in ice does delineate these different uh, segment, segments of the landscape. And even though Monet has signed and dated the painting 1881 it is like we think now that it's very possibly from this horrible winter in 1878 as Monet would often sign and it and inaccurately date his work several years after producing it. We can also see, again, just the real speed, the energy Monet's come across, uh, Monet gives to this work, as it was around this time that Monet began his practice of bringing several canvases with him at once, painting on one, that when the weather changed, he switched to another canvas, when it went back to the way it was, he'd bring back the first, thereby producing numerous canvases and paintings at the same time to create series of works, uh, which today we'll know him for his series of haystacks, water lilies, a church in Rouen. This idea is all begins here in Vitule. He's not the only, uh, he's not the only landscape artist we have in the collection. We also have Nathaniel Hone, one of Ireland's great landscape artists. Nathaniel Hone uh, initially trained as an engineer, worked with the Great Midlands, Ra Midlands Railway, but he went off to France in the 1850s, becoming the first Irishman to really study the uh, French naturalism style and bring it back to Ireland. He learned all these new techniques in France. He met a lot of artists like Manet and Monet. And he came back to Ireland in the 1870s with a whole new approach to painting. In particular, he had learned from his teacher, Thomas Couture, to essentially paint in a different way. Couture advised him that when painting, you should look at a subject for three minutes and then paint it for one, and then look at it for three minutes more, and then one. And in this way, you would really capture what you see with your eyes and not what you think you perceive. This gave his work a very real, very uh, kind of beautiful quality to it. And in coming back to Ireland, the Daniel Hone was able to essentially allow his work to flourish. It's actually been argued by critics that the Irish, that, uh, the Irish weather suited Nathaniel Hone far more than the French weather did, primarily because the French weather was too good, consistent. It was too predictable. You could often tell when it was going to be sunny or rain from the very uh, beginning of the morning. But in Ireland, with its constant shifting of storms and clouds and uh, mists, there was no telling when things could change. 
So Nathaniel Hohen, if he was to go out and paint on plein air in real life, he had to be fast. He had to be spontaneous. He had to capture the entire energy of the work very, very quickly because he had no guarantee when it would disappear and change. And him, he adored the Irish sky. You can see in this painting of, uh, of Malahide that the actual horizon is very low on the canvas. Most of the painting is given over to these beautiful, dramatic clouds teeming with light and reflected colors. In this particular scene, an evening Malahide Sands shows a part of the Malahide Strand that was at the time part of Malahide Golf Club, which Nathaniel Hone had himself founded. He lived in Malahide for many years with his wife, Magdalene Jameson of Jameson Whiskey. And the two of them, uh, by all accounts, really live a very happy life painting these scenes of the Irish coastline. This particular painting, though, holds a very special place within the history of the gallery itself. You see, this painting was on display in 1901 in an exhibition of Daniel Hone's work and the work of John Butler Yeats, which had been arranged by Sarah Purser. Purser had invited to the exhibition a young art dealer named Hugh Lane who was so inspired by the art he saw there of the Hone and Yeats that it lit a fire inside him and drove him to create this collection of modern art for Ireland. Lane went to visit Hone in his home in Rohini and Lane was so energetic, so inspired as, uh, forgive me, so kind of convincing in his dream of a new gallery that Hone had no choice but to be completely inspired by Lane. And that very day he gave Lane four paintings, including this one, to become part of his new collection. And in doing so, the piece would become, uh, would become part of, uh, the very first showing of our gallery's work. But it's not the only landscape work we have. While Nathaniel Hone was very much, <clears throat> while Nathaniel Hone was very much a, a formative figure in Irish landscape, in a time since different Irish landscape artists have taken his ideas and express them in very different manners, like we see here in this work by Patrick Collins. He, is, uh, Collins, we can, it was a Sligo man. He actually didn't start off as an artist. He spent 20 years working in insurance. But he began to attend art class in the evenings and teach himself how to paint, and he eventually dedicated his life to creating very beautiful uh, expressionist works, like we see here in this painting, High Brazil. In the 1960s, he went off to Brittany to visit uh, the, the uh, prehistoric sites of st and standing stones that exist there, these megalithic monuments, and it was from there that he began to develop his own style of subject matter. Uh, men here, meaning longstone, which would become, uh, which from which would emerge these kind of bluey gray atmospheric works, like what we can see in front of us. Uh, he lived for many years in uh, the tower in the grounds of Hope Castle, part of a, uh, an artist commune, where he was able to work on his art and he exhibited with the Irish Exhibition of Living Art for several years. This particular painting, uh, High Brazil, depicts the mythical island to the west of Ireland, High Brazil, also known as Tiernanog. And Collins, like Hone, was fascinated by the Irish weather. In particular, he loved the transient nature of the Irish weather, the 
uh, the kind of the soft light that's diffused through mist and cloud and creates this illusion of almost like you're looking in deep water. It was around this time he, he sort of found his signature style, these beautiful blues and grays, this idea of a very simple composition that uh, has a, a huge amount of space all around it, uh, consuming a large part of the canvas. And this painting was produced in 1963, uh, decades after Nathaniel Hone painted Malahide Sands. And we have an even more recent example of an Irish landscape art with this piece, Grayscale by Elizabeth McGill. Elizabeth McGill, of course, is a contemporary Irish artist um, who produces these almost dreamlike landscapes that are inspired by her childhood or her memories of her childhood in Antrim, the glens and the coastlines that she experienced at a young age. But they also, her paintings tend to have this sense of underlying unease, as though there's something just out of our range of sight, some underlying darkness or distress that we can never quite put our fingers on. They aren't real landscapes, they are very much imagined landscapes, even though they are inspired by her own memories. McGill has even referred to her landscapes as not real landscapes, but backdrops for how she feels and thinks and interprets the world. Um, this particular work, Grayscale, gives us a very kind of clear, uh, clear uh, depiction of her painting style. She starts off usually with very soft, thin layers of diluted paint, building up layer and layer of paint or collage or photography, scratching into paint, dragging things, smearing art. A lot of her work is very beautiful, but she's very aware of the limitations of beauty. She doesn't want her work to be too beautiful as she fears it will take away the spark of interest if it becomes too perfect. To the point that she has said she often drags her canvases across her studio floor to remove their perfection and beauty. Uh, these pieces are part of her way of expressing the world, in her own words, in all its morbid glamour and beat up beauty. And there really is this sense of the sublime to it, this wonderful aura of mystery, of energy, of atmosphere, that you can see looking at uh, Nathaniel Holmes or Patrick Holmes' work, has grown from over a century of Irish landscape art that she's aware of, that she's pulling from to create these very contemporary, very fascinating works. Uh, of course, here in Ireland, we, here in the collection, forgive me, we don't just have landscape art, we also have plenty of figurative art, such as this work here by Sean Keating, The Men of the West. And this particular painting was one, uh, is arguably one of his most nationalistic paintings. Sean Keating was born in Limerick, um, but when he attended school, he, uh, me, he attended art, art college, he trained with William Orpen, the acclaimed portrait painter. In fact, he actually traveled with Orpen to Orpen's studio in London to work as his assistant in the years leading up to the First World War. But while in college, he met Harry Clark. And it was during a trip to the Aran Islands with Harry Clark that Sean Keating began to really uh, come to the, real, uh, the personal realization that it was in the west of Ireland, in the Aran Islands, that the true embodiment of the ancient Irish people survived. Keating began to dress himself uh, as traditional Aran Island man, wearing the, the, the bonnie and the white cloth shirt, the crisp, the hand-woven belt, both of which we can see in this painting. 
And the painting itself actually depicts Sean Keating. <clears throat> Sean Keating himself on the left. You can see he's got a he's got a very kind of striking face. He's staring directly at the viewer, almost making this connection with us as if he's waiting for us to start a conversation. The other two figures we can see either side of him are taught to be his brother Joe, uh, a member of the Irish Volunteers or the IRB. And it's been theorized that the reason why both paintings of Joe have his face partially concealed is because Keating was afraid that by painting a full on portrait of his brother, it could be used to help capture him during the War of Independence. Now this particular painting is also unique in that it is, we believe, the first use of the Irish tricolor to represent Ireland's flag in a painting. The painting itself was begun in 1915 when Keating was at his studio here in Dublin. However, he temporarily left his side after the dawning of the Easter Rising. And it was during the Easter Rising that for the first time, the Irish tricolor was flown above the GPO and became in many ways an emblem of Irish nationalism. And it's taught that Keating went back to studio after this and painted in the flag and himself holding the flagpole. Uh, again, just again, really reinforcing that this is one of Keating's most nationalistic paintings. After the War of Independence, Keating would become one of Ireland's premier artists, depicting the development of the electrical sheet scheme in Shannon at Ireland, Crusha. Uh, the painting works for the Eucharistic Congress in the 1930s. And he also took up a role as a teacher in the Metropolitan School of Art, just as his mentor Orpin had been. And it was, it was while teaching in, an, in the Metropolitan School of Art in Dublin that he came, that he came to teach oh, pardon, this artist, Maurice McGonagall. And Maurice McGonagall was Again, uh, uh, another kind of artist interested in depicting social uh, and to some extent political uh, art. He was a cousin of Harry Clark and he had originally began his apprenticeship in Harry Clark's father's studios as a stained glass artist. However, during the War of Independence, he joined the Fina Aaron and ended up uh, being captured, spending time in Kilmainham Jail and, Bally, and Ballykinler. After the truce in 1921, he was released, continued his apprenticeship in Harry Clark Studios, and began attending classes at the Dublin Metropolitan School of Art, where he was inspired by Sean Keating's work. You can even see the style of painting of these figures is quite reminiscent of the very dramatic uh, and striking looks from Keating's portraits. This is one of his most political and socially minded works, the Dockers, where we see depicted three button men, that is men who were hired on a daily basis at the dock. They are waiting for the reading of the list where it would be announced which of these workers would actually have a day's work ahead of them and which would have to go home. And you can see there's a tension in these three men. These are actual button men that were brought to McGonagall's studio by Jim Larkin, the trade union leader and a good friend of McGonagall's. Who, and Maurice McGonagall has managed to capture this sense of tension, frustration. The two men on the left have just arrived in Dublin from County Clare, while the man on the right is a lot older, has been here much longer, so he is more disillusioned, less, uh, I suppose, tense as the other two. While the three men have their expressions carefully guarded, McGonagall reinforces their inner anger, frustration, uh, 
and helplessness by painting them against this backdrop of the red boat. The striking color which intensifies not only, not only the expressions on their faces, but the mood and emotion conveyed through the painting. And in doing so, it really helps to get across the social condition a lot of these people found themselves in, in Ireland in the 1930s and the struggle that people faced. <coughs> and that's the thing, a lot of Irish artists have portrayed social issues in their work, not just Maurice McGonagall. We also have this work here, The Foundation Stones by Brian McGuire, sorry, forgive me, Brian McGuire. Uh, which depicts the St. Patrick's Mental Asylum here in Dublin. Now, Brian Maguire is one of um, Ireland's uh, kind of foremost expressionist painters. He paints re uh, representational work to a certain degree, but he, allow a lot, he allows a lot of his emotions and feelings to come across in this quite striking, almost violent manner of painting. He doesn't shy away from the issues he wants to portray in his work. In fact, he almost confronts you with it, making it impossible for you to ignore what he's trying to tell you. Maguire has, in his own words, always preferred to go to places where there's no queue. So prisons, Damascus, mental institutions. He, go, he wants to portray these people in isolation, cut off in some way from the rest of the world. And it's often been a fascination with him across his career. He's recently done work in, uh, about the destruction of the city of Aleppo uh, in Syria. He's, he's done works in Sao Paulo in Brazil about the, 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 falal, falal, uh, the favelas there. Um, but even here in Ireland, he looks at serious social issues that in some way relate to oppression or uh, social justice. So not just our prisons, but work, uh, the political, political subjects, the impact of the Catholic Church, and in this case, the approach to mental illness that was so prevalent in Ireland for so long. If you look at the lower half of the painting, you will see a very lightly painted in silhouette of a face, downturned and saddened as if the person depicted has become eclipsed, their life force drained from them and they have simply begun and they have simply lost all hope. The colors that McGuire chooses, these dark grays and browns, they give a sense of forlornness, moroseness, and sadness to the work. But you can still see these bright, vibrant colors, these, art, these yellows, these greens shining through, giving us an idea of the actual breath of life of the people who were confined to these institutions. He doesn't want to, he wants to always bring attention to these issues. Maguire has himself viewed painting as an act of solidarity. And he continues to work with social issues to this very day, uh, teaching in the Dublin, well, the renamed Dublin Metropolitan School, what's now the National College of Art and Design, and trying to, again, pass on this, this social-minded uh, activism through his art. And again, we see it, different ways that Irish artists get across their approach to the world, to the world, to political situations, social issues, and how they do so in very unique and uh, unexpected manners. This particular work by John Kindness, Monkey and Dog, is his way of expressing uh, the long-term sectarian violence in Northern Ireland. John Kindness has often used non-traditional subject, uh, non-traditional materials like mosaics or frescoes to produce art, uh, while the while using them to create very modern, very contemporary subjects. 
uh, this particular piece, you can see a Republican dog fighting with a loyalist monkey. The two of them are intertwined, biting at each other, but at the same time, perfectly balanced. And this idea of the dog and the monkey appears in a lot of Kindness's work. Uh, it was actually inspired by an 18th century print, Mrs. Midnight's Performing Animals, in which a bunch of dogs lay siege to a monkey town, which reminded him of the siege of Derry. He depicts, uh, he uses this, again, not very common uh, process here in Ireland, mosaic, to create this very kind of visceral sculpture. Um, and the way he's painted, the way he's, forgive me, the way he's constructed it, we can see that the figures are perfectly balanced in a sort of yin and yang position neither of which have any advantage over the other. They are seemingly constantly, eternally locked into this, into this battle. He took inspiration from not only Greek art with the mosaics, but also from Japanese art, taking the shape and the form of the piece from Netsuki, this Japanese art of carving kind of toggles that you'd use to hold, uh, pocket purses from a kimono. And these are all perfectly rounded. There's this idea of perfect balance that it creates an image from all sides. You know, we're, just only, we're looking only at one angle in this photograph, but no matter what direction you come at from this piece, you still get a complete image. Uh, Kindness's work is, can also be found on a public uh, art pieces around Ireland, uh, such as Waterfall of Souvenirs and Big Fish, both of which are in Belfast. And he continues to state, and he continues to use his art to highlight, again, his own uh, social and political in interests in a way that is remarkably different to almost any other artist, at least that I've seen. But, uh, we don't just have Irish art in the collection. We also have a great collection of international modern art, such as this piece by Philip Guston, Outskirts, from 1969. Guston was one of the uh, kind of leaders of the abstract expressionism movement in America. He, uh, he having made a quite dramatic choice to move away from abstraction into representational art in 1967, a move which initially was misunderstood and derived by a lot of the art world. But in the time since, the work, this representational work he's produced, has gone on to become some of his most famous and admired works. We can see in this piece the reds and pinks that are very typical of his represent representational work from this time. A lot of it uh, is very personal to Gaston. It's very, deliberately very cartoonish. He makes this kind of visual language from imagery of his life. So you see a lot of recurring images like the Klansman hoods you can see in this painting, bare light bulbs, books, uh, cigarette butts, they appear across his work just as means of expressing himself. And, and these hooded clan figures uh, are quite a common motif because he had an, he had a uh, experience with the Ku Klux Klan when he was only 17 during a strike at a Los Angeles factory. The Ku Klux Klan actually came and destroyed many paintings he produced of this strike. They just literally slashed them to pieces. So the, they, they appear a lot as these kind of ominous figures seemingly uh, ruling this unknown town or occasionally he dressed himself up in a, in a hood to kind of imagine what it'd be like to be evil. We have in the background of the painting these kind of monumental uh, monoliths in red that look somewhat like apartment buildings or somewhat like massive caves. They're inspired by not only the 
uh, buildings he would see on the way to New York along the highways, but also by his fireplace in New York. Again, he always brings back this personal visual language he's developed into his work. This particular piece uh, was shown at his, at his kind of uh, important exhibition in, 19, in New York in Marlborough Fine Art, where a lot of the art world misunderstood his choice to go back to representational work, but it would end up becoming again, one of his trademarks, one of his most important contributions to the art world. Not to say we don't have abstract work in the collection. Here we have one of our pieces by Sean Scully. Born here in Dublin, Sean Scully's very kindly donated a large number of his works to the gallery. And if you go in person, you will see we have an entire room dedicated to his work, uh, the Sean Scully room the only room dedicated to him in all of Europe. Sean Scully takes these really massive canvases and creates these geomet geometric series of blocks and colors to create very striking, almost overpowering canvases. Again, this is one of the downsides of a slideshow, it does not give you the massive scale of his work. Um, it's just ginormous. And what you can see, I think, with his work is he actually paints uh, in oil paint in such a way that the paint of his underlying layers shines true. So if you look at this piece, Wall of Light Alba, you can actually see the very kind of beautiful texture from the paint bristles as they drag their way through the wet oil paint. You have uh, this quite uh, tactile approach to a painting. Scully was first inspired to look at geometric art when he visited Morocco as a young man, and he was inspired by the uh, striped and banded architectural elements of Morocco. He also arrived in America in the 1970s during the height of abstract expressionism, where he was able to absorb all this great work by artists such as Philip Cusson, we just seen. But this particular piece, and many of the works we have in the collection, come from one series in particular, the Wall of Light. The Wall of Light series was inspired in the 1980s by a trip he took to San Watanayu in Mexico, where he made these very quick watercolor sketches of the ruins of Mayan buildings, these massive blocks of stone that seem to change color depending on the time of day and the light that struck them. He looked at these stone blocks, he looked at the dry stone walls in Ireland, he took all this different visual inspiration and combined them to create this series of, it almost always looks, looks to me like a uh, tapestry or, or a wooden inlay, these massive kind of perfect geometric blocks that are still painted in a very human way. You know, there's no perfect ruler at straight edges, it's just, uh, you can almost imagine him with his, with his paintbrush dragging his brush across the canvases. There's a great sense of energy to the work. And, and, this, and that's something I think that's important about the galleries. We don't just have paintings and sculptures and drawings. We also have a lot of modern forms of media. So we have video work, an exhibition we had recently included uh, visual, virtual reality components, and we also have an artist studio. This is a studio of Francis Bacon. Uh, Francis Bacon, of course, born here in Dublin, but lived most of his life in England. Bacon was one of the greatest figurative painters of the 20th century. He, uh, deliberately kept his studio in this quite chaotic, uh, almost over-brimming state because that was how he worked best. And when he passed away in the 1990s, the man who inherited everything from him, his best friend John Edwards, believed that 
if he could preserve Bacon's studio, he could preserve how Francis Bacon painted, how he created his work far more effectively than any book or written account ever could. So they, it was very kindly offered to us as here in Dublin as the place where Bacon was born. And over a period of several years, a whole team of archaeologists, conservators, and art historians moved the studio from Bacon's home in London over here to the gallery, where you can see it now exactly as it was when he died, down to even the, the smallest uh, particles of dust in the corners. And I mentioned he kept this deliberately like this because this is how he worked best. Bacon himself once said that, I feel at home here in this chaos because chaos suggests images to me. And that was very true. Uh, Bacon worked primarily from photographs, but very often a brand new pristine photograph wouldn't give him a lot of inspiration. Instead, he would like to bring it into his studio, place it with all the other ephemera and imagery and books and art materials in the space, perhaps leave it for a while. There might, it might become torn or ripped or have paint staining it or be crumpled up. And then when Bacon rediscovered it later, affected so uh, physically by just being in the studio, then that picture would inspire him. And so he was able to use his studio as a way to generate his own inspiration. And he worked in the studio for nearly 30 years. He was very happy there. That's where he produced some of his best work. And it is, we, and it, as far as we're concerned, it is an absolute uh, gem of a piece. I completely agree with John Edwards that the studio tells you so much about Bacon, all the thousands of items in it, from images to uh, paintbrushes. You can see how he used to paint on his walls and to mix colors. You can see elements of his, that appear in his paintings like bare light bulbs where it inspired him. There's so much of Bacon's work of his life that comes from the studio and goes into his work. It really is in a, arguably a self-portrait of the man himself. And folks, I'll probably leave it there. I've only gone through a very small selection of uh, some of the works here in the collection today, but I hope I've given you some inspiration and I hope to see you actually in the gallery where we, where we have lots going on, lots of new exhibitions constantly, all the time more modern art being added to collection. You never know what you'll find, and there you go. So I hope you enjoyed the talk and hope to see you in the gallery sometime.